African Renaissance. The concept that the African people and nation shall overcome the current challenges confronting the continent and achieve cultural, scientific, and economic renewal is here, with young men and women taking the lead. Some call them the new school heroes. We call them under 40 CEOs. Before I start about building wealth, I really need to sort of talk to you guys. I'm glad it's a small group, so I can look at each, um, each person individually um, as to what wealth really is. Because wealth has different definitions for different people. I'll explain what I mean. Some people, like my parents, for instance, they were pastors. They believed in deliverance and holiness. They never even wanted money at all. So when I went to my parents at about 15 or 16, and I said, you know, I want to make this million dollars by 25, my parents were like, ah, you know the, th you know the things that people have to do to make that kind of money? You don't want to be among them. What you need to chase is your salvation. Um, so that was what was important to my parents. Holiness is the order of the day. In fact, when I was growing up, we used to go to church every single day from Monday to Sunday. Saturday. So Monday was prayer warriors meeting. Tuesday was the first choir practice. Wednesday, of course, was Bible study. Thursday was the second prayer warriors because the Tuesday we used to, Monday we used to pray for Nigeria, but because we lived in London Thursday, we also used to pray for the England and that was the London focus prayers. Friday was all night. All night used to last from like 9 to like 5 a.m. Then Saturday we had another choir practiced to practice for Sunday. And then we also had um, a children's service. So I was in the Sunday school um, teaching. So we also used to have the rehearsals for our Sunday school, whatever performance the kids were doing. Then on Sunday, that was the grand finale. We used to spend about 9 a.m. to like 5 p.m. in church, different services, the morning services, service, my dad. And this was all for like 40 people. The members of the church that could stand, Christmas is devilish, this one is demonic. There are not many people that want to hear that gospel anymore. They want to hear you are going to be rich. So our church was actually quite small. We used to spend a lot of time there. But that was my parents' definition of wealth. Wealth in the spirits. So um, there are other people's definitions of wealth. Some people believe they really want power. So there are some people that you go to all these Yoruba states. They might not have that much money, but it's impossible to win an election without them. One old man, one uh, you know, sort of mobilizer, one person in Lagos that everybody has to go and see. They don't really want money. That is not their definition of wealth. But they need that power though. And every so every politician must go and see them. But that is their definition of wealth. Um, a few years ago, one of my best friends who we went to medical school together said she was going to start a food blog. And she didn't want to do medical practice anymore. And I was like, so how much money can you make from this food block? She said she's not interested, that she wants to be at home and um, she wants to focus on her husband and her kids. By that time, she had had up to four children. I was like, so what about all the dreams that we used to set that we're going to make this much money, we're going to go into surgery, we're going to do this? She's like, I'm just not interested anymore. My, my goals have changed. Her definition of wealth is having as many children as possible. She's now number six since then. And staying at home. If she does not cook for her husband, it's a disaster. She's always baking one cake, baking one bread. Me, I don't even go to the kitchen. And my worst nightmare is staying at home. I can't stay at home. I'm too restless. I'm sure you've seen me just within the minutes. I, I'm restless. I need to be moving about, making one phone call or the other, doing something. Like, I, I can't remember. I hardly even sleep at home. Usually I'm on the road. I'm in Abuja. I'm somewhere. But just to be staying somewhere, it's, it's, it's completely ludicrous to me. But that is her definition of wealth. So I think before we even talk or get into the conversation about accumulating monetary wealth, Make sure that that is exactly what you want. Because otherwise, you can spend your whole life working towards that goal, 
of this million dollars, that million dollars, and then you get it at around 70, and you realize that that actually wasn't what you wanted to do with your life. Um, and that actually happened to me, because as I so, so told my parents that this is the amount I want to accumulate by the age of 25, I actually accumulated it. And when I actually hit that goal, I realized that that really wasn't what I wanted at all. The money was in the bank, but I didn't even know what to do with it, because that was not my personality. This shoe that I'm wearing is one of only three shoes that I own. I've always been that way. I've never felt the need for material things at all. And the only reason why I have three pairs of shoes and not two pairs of shoes is because, if you've noticed, maybe coming up the stage, I walk a bit funny, so I need two pairs of heels, because I always break one, so one is always with the cobbler, and one I'll be wearing, and then I swap them over. So that's the only reason why I even have three pairs of shoes. So I was so determined to escape poverty that I thought, oh, you know, having this million dollars in my account will make me happy. But when I had it, this is my one bag. This is the only bag that I, I own in my life. The jewelry, I don't wear. My wedding ring, my husband, obviously, I have to wear it because he'll get angry if I don't wear it. But you can't see any other jewelry on me, no earrings, no nothing. So for me, the body was pretty useless. So I actually ran away from Nigeria for like two weeks because I actually had to figure out what is my definition of wealth. It's obviously not this money that I've accumulated. And I know that some people, when they want to find themselves, they go to India, go and study with the monks. I've heard some people, uh, they go to Japan and go wandering in the wilderness. I went to Miami because I thought that maybe this would be the place to find myself by the beach you know, with some party people there. And I actually started thinking, what do I really, really, really want? And I discovered that I, I try and be a bit holy because of the way I, brought, I was brought up. But obviously, I was not as spiritual as my parents. Um, I discovered that it was not really political power. I like looking at politicians. I like maybe having a few meetings with them and strategizing with them and all that. But... Ah, the inside of politics, I'm not sure, it's a bit scary, so definitely political power wasn't my thing. Children, in fact, they scare me. When I see them running around like this, I'll start walking the opposite way, so obviously that wasn't the meaning of my life. Um, and I realized that it was actually impacting on others that I wanted to do. That was what would give my life meaning. Um, and I came back with a new mission to try and make as much impact as possible on my community. And that became um, my mission. But in order to make impact and do as much for people as possible, I realized that I still had to keep on growing my company and being profitable. Because you can't help the poor if you are part of them. Yeah? Um, so I decided to continue running my company and continue growing my company. Um, so, what I want to really talk about today is how I was able to do that. Um, my format may not be everybody's format, of course, but just the ways that I was able to do that. Because I find a lot of people uh, that give this kind of advice, and even when I was growing my business, the kind of people that I was taking advice from were not people that had done it before. So, um, for example, when I wanted to invest my money, I talked to my account officer. Oh, what should I invest in? You know, what do you think? What? They, they didn't have the money to invest, and it's very easy to spend somebody else's money. So after I lost a lot of money with that advice, I decided that I had to learn a lot more about finance so I could pick my own shares and stocks. Maybe I'll still talk to them, but I had to know exactly what I was doing with investing. There was this funny part of Donald Trump's book where the guy that had advised him on all his multi-million dollar deals called him and said, Trump, I need to buy a house, and I'm really stressed. Uh, and Donald Trump was like, wait, you're the one that asked me to buy this property for $2 billion. You're the one that asked me to do this deal for $1 billion. How much is the house? He said, $60,000. And I don't know what to do. Trump, please help me. I need to buy a house, and I'm scared. Uh, but this was the guy that was giving all the advice that to go and do this deal. This is what you should do. So it's very easy to spend other people's money. Um, and I think that it's very, very important, first of all, for you guys, everybody in this room, to know what they want to do with their own money. Yes, you can take advice from other people, but don't let anybody spend your money without you understanding what they are spending your money on. Um, so in terms of your life philosophy as well, I think that's really, really important, knowing exactly what you want out of life. Like if you look on Instagram, 
then obviously Hush Puppy looks richer than Dangote. Because Dangote will, doesn't take pictures. The jet is not even a luxury to him. It's just because in one day he might need to move from Congo to uh, Kenya to Cameroon to Senegal, but left to him. If it was possible, he'll still be taking commercial. But if you look at some of these Instagram stars, then you think that they are far richer than the actual billionaires. And it depends on what you want out of life and your lifestyle. So there were three lessons that I've learned, well, three to four lessons that I've learned that I'll share, and it's about taking control of your time, taking control of your relationships, um, and taking control of your money, and taking control of your values. So um, in terms of time when you're building wealth, um, I think you need to be very, very individualistic as to how you spend your time, especially if you're from a poorer background. So the thing about being from a poorer background is it's more of a grind. It takes a lot more time. So the lifestyle that somebody like DJ Copy is enjoying now, somebody like Jimovia that came from a very poor family, he could not approach that lifestyle till he was 40 years old. So it also depends on the kind of background that you're from, how much time it will actually take you to accumulate the level of wealth to get the lifestyle that you live, um, you want to live. So you have to be very, very, very careful with your time. And I'd say the poorer your parents are, the more careful you must be with your time. And you must use your time very differently from people that were born in more privileged circumstances. Um, because it's easier for them to attain wealth compared to you. But it's not impossible for you to attain wealth. So I can remember when I was with some billionaires, and one smallish girl, maybe about 25, walked into the room. And I introduced her. I didn't know who her father was. Immediately, all of the billionaires stood up. Ah, I know your father. Fantastic. What do you do? Oh, how can I give you this contract? And she must have thought that she was doing very, very well in business because... She had given her 30-second elevator pitch, and every billionaire in the room wanted to know who she was and how they could do business with her. But there are a lot of people that do that business. But her father's name carried so much weight that I was angry. I was like, okay, so me, that I've worked for 10 years to get into this room. This is how this girl is picking up contracts. But that's why I said it's very important for you to think about how you manage your time. How you manage your time in terms of professional development. So when you do have those 30 seconds to say something, you come out with something sensible. And the more you read, the more you take professional development courses, the more that you speak to really smart people, the more that information all kind of merges together to give you results that you could have never imagined. And that's definitely been the case um, for me. So I listen to an average of probably four or five books a week, and I have done for the past 10 years. They're all on my phone, so whenever I'm traveling or in my car, I'm always listening to a book. Um, and I concentrate on some hard skills, so I've taken some accounting courses, some economic courses, some finance courses, but I concentrate more on soft skills, because the hard thing about soft skills is that you have to continue learning them. So things like communication, things like um, emotional intelligence, things like influence are really, really important to me. Because if, you know, you're not from an influential family, then you have to try and be you yourself, have to be try and more, be more influential. Um, and people think it's impossible, but it's not. These are skills that can be learned. Charisma can be learned. How to speak can be learned. If you're from a poor family, again, one thing that will happen is you can disgrace yourself very easily if you don't know what to say in certain circles because you just didn't grow up that way. So when people are having these conversations and you just blur out something, what you say might not make sense and they'll immediately find you out that you're not supposed to be here. So it's very important to work on those skills um, to give yourself uh, a hand up, I guess. Um, so how you manage your time is very, very, very important. Um, and that's really the first lesson that I learned. Um, the second lesson was about managing my relationships. Um, and I learned probably the hard way that poverty is not necessarily the absence of money in your pocket, but it's the absence of the type of people that can take you to the next level in life. So managing your relationships is also very important and being strategic about the type of people um, that you surround yourself with. 
being very disciplined about the type of people that you surround yourself with. Um, one, I had a lot of opportunities in the past four years of doing business to do bad things. Maybe cut corners in business, do a little bit, make some money on the side with some other kind of business that is not entirely straightforward. But while some people might be able to do it, and they'll come out of EFCC one day, if I do it, Pastor Recurring will just be praying for me from London. There's nothing that can make me come out. I'll spend the rest of my life there. So you have to be very careful not to hang out with dodgy people because it will ruin your reputation. Not to do business with dodgy people because they'll come out of EFCC and you won't. Um, and you have to really make sure that you sanitize your circle of friends so you're with people that really have the same goals and aspirations as you. I think that's super important. And also be super disciplined about, um, you might not be able to get a mentor. I have not really, um, even at my stage now, I have some mentors, but I've found that the biggest, sort of, most helpful group of people to me have not been the people that I was chasing about, people billionaires. They, are, they, are not, they cannot be useful to you that much because, there's no symbiosis. You're not doing deals together. There's no pro quid quo. And they're not your fathers. They have their own children. So I think the most useful network for people that are coming up are actually peers. People that $50,000 of business, $20,000 of business is a lot of money. So they try and repay the favor to you. And also, uh, when you're looking across and looking up at building your network, also look down. Because people's peers have been very, very useful to me. Fam. Aviation security in my business, air traffic control, all these people that people overlook, they've actually been very, very helpful in terms of building my network. And for any budding politicians, market women, the touts or the people that you call touts, area boys, they're still very, very influential if you're in, if you're looking for, if you have political aspirations. So I look up sometimes, but I know that those relationships, yes, you do the needful but they might not get you so far. I look across most of the time and build my networks across. So people that haven't yet made it, but people that have a good head on their shoulders and probably um, I can do things for and I can serve and I can solve their problems and not necessarily am I expecting anything in return, but there is a law of reciprocity that means that if you do enough things for enough people, you at least get one thing in return. One of those people you helped will become a minister or a senator or a somebody. And if you have picked your circle well, it will become something where that relationship can be useful. And then I also try and look down a lot because those people, the PAs, in fact, half of my hampers Christmas go to PAs. Those people know how to open doors in miraculous ways. And unlike the minister, unlike the people that are changeable, they're always in the ministry. Their fathers worked in that same ministry. So they can open a lot of doors, and I would say that spend some time on those as well. So um, I've spoken about managing your time and um, managing your circle and relationships. And um, the last one is managing your money, which for the first few months or a few years of my business, I was actually quite bad at until I learned that wealth is not only what you can earn, but it's also what you can keep. And I'm sure you've all seen, I think it's very common with entertainers, that they seem to earn all this money during their years of entertainment. Football stars, singers, they seem to make all this money. They're on Instagram taking a bath in dollars. They're in the Gucci shop buying out the whole store. And then a few years later, they're crowdfunding for medical funds. Or you see them, they, they don't have that money anymore because wealth is not necessarily about what you can earn. It's also about what you can keep. So it goes back to what I was saying earlier. No offense to the financial um, advisor. I use financial advisors a lot, but I also read every annual report for every company I'm investing in cover to cover myself. I look at the balance sheets. I look at the profit and loss. I look at the cash flow statements. And those things come very naturally to me because when I realized that my purpose was making impact and I realized that I cannot be poor, otherwise I could not make that much impact. Then go to foundation it doesn't spend that much of a percentage of his wealth. But it's the biggest foundation in Africa. 
not because he's giving all his money to charity, it's because that 0.005% of his wealth is more than 100% or 1,000% of my own wealth. So even though he's giving a very small amount, it's still more than most people can do. So I realized that the more I can sort of be smart about money, the more impact I can make. And I made a decision to start being smart about things, looking, researching uh, my finances.